Welcome to today's homeowner with Danny Lipford. Expert advice on improving your home. From the pages of today's homeowner magazine and professional remodeler, Danny Lipford. Well, if you joined us last week, you'll notice a big difference in how this project looks. Now, this is where we're enclosing an existing garage to produce quite a bit of new living area. You know, this is real popular in converting garages for living area because it's economical to gain the living space, as well as it's a large area, almost 500 square feet. Now, we're using the square footage for a game room and a full bathroom. Now, the bathroom creates a bit of a challenge because, as you can see, it's below grade and to get the drainage to work properly, we had to put in a special drainage system. We'll show you how we've done that. Also, we'll look at antique heart pine flooring that is being installed on the interior. We'll show you how that's being done in just a little while. Also, when we come back, I'll tell you what's behind these doors. Now, an area like this can be used for a lot of different reasons. In this case, we're storing the homeowner's golf cart in here. Makes for a perfect place there. Homeowner has a minor disability, makes it a little difficult to get around the neighborhood. This helps a lot. Now, this area was where the large garage door was originally before we enclosed this garage, and we were able to fill it in with the three windows that match the existing windows. Also, we were able at a local salvage yard to find some of the original style of bricks that match real well. We'll visit that salvage yard in just a little bit. Right now, let's visit Wiley Bullock, our job superintendent. You know, some of the things you need to consider if you're enclosing a garage is good access into the area. Here we have it made because we have a staircase coming right down where it should. So that makes this perfect situation. Another thing we haven't made here is we have no vertical post, just a horizontal beam that goes across to support the second story. So many times we have garages that we're enclosing and we have that post right in the middle, it makes it hard to work around. Also, we're trying to utilize as much space as we can by creating a closet tucked under the existing stairs. That'll be perfect once some shelving is installed in there to hold some of the many games I'm sure they'll have here in this game room. Well, basically, this room is down to where we're ready for flooring. All of the drywall's been completed, the trim work's been completed, and the painter is all completed other than just a little bit of a touch-up. But before we can install the antique heart pine flooring, we've been able to put down a waterproofing on the original slab to seal it off real well. Then we'll come back over it with three-quarter inch plywood glued and nailed to the floor. Then we'll be ready to install the three and a half inch tongue and groove flooring. Now this pine is, as I say, an antique heart pine that was actually milled from some old timbers that were taken out of a demolished building. We'll look at that process in just a little bit. Right now, let's look at the bathroom. Well, Wiley, I see the Culture Marble installers have just about completed everything, but I understand they had a problem down here. Yeah, when they was installing the piece here for the footstool, uh, for the shower doors, of course, they broke, the piece broke, but they'll go to the shop tomorrow and uh, make another piece and bring it back and install it. Okay, then the shower door installer then would be able to actually measure for the doors. Well, I had him scheduled a day to measure for the doors, which he was here. Uh, the piece being broken didn't stop us, so we're still on schedule there. It didn't stop us from measuring. Okay. You know, many times on custom showers like this, you have to wait till this stage in the job before you can actually measure for the shower door because it's made of tempered glass, and tempered glass is hard to cut, so you want to make sure that you get it right the first time. Now, Wiley, when we were here last, we had a large trench in the concrete slab running from the shower drain over to the toilet drain, and it extended on out into the crawl space behind this wall. Now, because of the height that we had of the original drain line, we had to put in the residential lift station. I heard that was quite a task. Yes, it was. It, it took two men uh, two days to remove the dirt by bucket, and of course, uh, three feet wide and five feet long, and of course, it was about six feet deep, so it was quite a job. There was a lot of dirt coming out of there, and that's so that you could get back down to this level then, so that the plumber would be able to tie his line oh, in. Oh, exactly, and because of the amount of dirt on the back side, of course, we had to build a pressure-treated material uh, retaining wall to keep the dirt uh, from caving in back onto the sump pump. I see. In case any maintenance ever needed was needed back there, they would be able to get back into that area. Uh, of course, there is access, and of course, we had the electrician provide us a 
110 outlet uh, uh, that is dedicated for the, uh, the lift station itself. Okay, well great. You know, if you have a situation like this where you're down below grade, maybe a basement or a garage like this, and you're trying to install a bathroom, this type of lift station may be just the thing. And we had to go up about six or seven feet vertically but um, I understand on this one it could actually pump up to 12 to 15 feet. Uh, that's correct. Uh, this one is designed for 12 to 15 feet, and of course, uh, if you have a further lift, there are systems designed for that also. Get ready to review your fix-it list as Danny and Home Repair Pro Alan Lyle show you this week's simple solution. Well, Alan, I know there's a lot of tips to know about cutting a door off properly. Give us some ideas. Well, Danny, you can see that I'm putting some masking tape on the door right now. That's to protect the door against splintering, plus it will also protect it from scarring of the saw itself. So that's why this is down here. Now, what we have is carpet going in. These doors are going to be inoperable. So we want to cut off about a half an inch, all right? So let's mark it off. Yeah, I noticed also you used carpet on these mm -hmm. saw horses to protect that finish. Sure did. Well, good to have a little bit of scrap handy just for that purpose. All right, Danny, if you'll put the edge of the level there. All right, I've got a utility blade. Now, Danny, what I'm going to do is actually score this. Hold your end tight. I'm going to come down. What this does is actually, believe it or not, starts our cut the full length of the door. Always be careful, too, Danny, when handling a utility blade. All right. Okay. Now, our next step is to actually cut this. What I'm going to do, Danny, is freehand this. I've done this a few times, so it's not too difficult for me, but there's also another way that you might tell us about using the four-foot level. Yeah, I understand. Taking the four-foot level with a clamp on either end, you're able to actually use it as a guide against the guide of the saw to cut that if you're a little more inexperienced in cutting a door. That's right. All right, safety goggles on if you'll hold the door for me. Okay. And here we go. Good cut. Let's see how this masking tape held up here. There you go. When you've been a remodeler for 20 years, you get to know your way around your local salvage yard. Here I often find the right style door, window, brick, or trim piece I need to really make an addition not look like an addition. Now for you, the homeowner, beautiful architectural pieces and even furniture can be found at some salvage places. You know, one of the more popular items at a salvage yard are the doors they have available. But keep in mind, it's not like a home center that you can just call up and ask them if they have a particular size in stock. Really, you need to get into your old clothes, take your tape measure, and spend some time browsing in all the doors that they'll have available. Now, before you leave home, it's a good idea maybe to take a picture of the style door. That'll help you remember exactly the type of door you're looking for. Also, make sure you measure the opening very carefully. It's, uh, it's real bad when you buy a door, take it home, and it doesn't fit. Now, another thing that you need to look at when you're looking at doors are the condition of them. Now, you can see some of these really have some paint problems that are really peeling off, and this can be a real headache if you're trying to put a good finished coat of paint on that. So look for something a little better shape than that. Also, look at some of the joints where they join together. This particular one you can see is a real tight joint, but if they have any separation in those, it's almost impossible to glue and clamp that door back together. So you need to pay a particular attention to that. Also, you may be installing a more modern lock set than this one is set up for. You can see this is a mortise type lock that goes in. Your new or conventional type locks may not have that same type of strike plate and you may have to feel that. Now if it's filled or plugged, it's okay if it's a painted door, but if it's a stained door, it can really be a problem in actually blending in the stained finish. Now another good idea is many salvage yards and many refinishing places have a dipping tank so you can dip and strip the door with chemicals that they actually submerge the door down in a vat and they're able to remove every bit of paint off of it. If you're staining a door, this is a great way to go. But remember, make sure you neutralize with vinegar any of those doors after they've been dipped and stripped or you'll never keep any paint or any finish on it. 
Now this particular salvage yard spends a lot of time recycling some of the beams, wood beams they remove out of some of their demolished buildings. Now you'd be surprised at what great looking heart pine flooring can be milled from these old beams. You know, some of these beams are over a hundred years old and some of them even have notches on them that were created with an old hand saw many years ago. Now to convert this into finished flooring is a real interesting process. Oh, when the, when the timbers come into the yard, we first get them out of the weather, dry stack them under shed, then start pulling them out one at a time, going through them completely with a metal detector, getting out everything from small nails, large bolts, even found some musket shot stuck in the wood. Then if it's a small board, we bring it out to our small resaw and just cut it into a three quarter by six slab. If it's a large timber, say 12 by 12 or, or larger, we cut it in the large resaw, then back in a small resaw and into, into the slabs. From there, they can go straight into the molder where they come out a finished product except for culling out fractures, uh, you know, loose knots in the, in the sort, and then it's ready for installation. You know, the heart pine floors will look great in the new game room once they're installed, and we'll look at it a little bit later in the show. Now, another thing we were able to find here at the salvage yard is the old bricks we needed for the front of the garage enclosure. Now, we were able to get an exact size and color match, and it really makes the job look great. But if you're about to do some remodeling or build an addition where you need some bricks, it's a good idea to take a chisel and a hammer and chip you a few of the bricks out of the wall that you'll be tearing down to build the addition and take these bricks with you to the salvage yard or brickyard so that you can match not only the color but also the size of the brick. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It's time to check out the Home Center for this week's best new product with Danny and today's Homeowner Magazine's Editor-in-Chief, Paul Spring. Well, Paul, I know you and your staff had picked this Elmer's wood glue as one of your best new products, but what's so innovative about this? Well, it may just look like wood glue, Danny, but this ProBond wood glue is terrific stuff. It actually uses an old carpenter's trick of mixing sawdust in with a glue so that you can hide that glue line. Mm -hmm. Well, they do the same thing in a bottle. In this case, they take wood fibers and actually put it in the glue. So if you get a little, little sloppy with that glue when you're uh, putting a joint together, it's going to stain out and be unnoticeable. Mm -hmm. Well, this makes it a lot easier having it in a container like this, and I understand this one also is available in larger sizes, and it's uh, refillable. It sure is. It's got that wide mouth, and that makes it a lot easier to refill. This 12-ounce size is about $6, but uh, you can get it in the gallons as well. There's also another important uh, feature that makes this very, very easy to use. Why don't you pop the cap there, and I'll show you. It's a gel. Okay, well, One of the try. problems with glue is, by the time you get the pieces together, it's running all over the place. Now, check this out. Well, that's great. Well, that'll make a big difference if you're using it. And uh, I see here, too, exterior use. Exactly right. Whether uh, you're repairing the yard furniture or whatever it may be, both interior and exterior, it's weather resistant. So uh, you, you really got a glue that's going to last. Yeah, there's a lot of applications for this. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, I'm making my final list of the last few items that need to be taken care of before we turn this project over to the homeowners later today, including things like the little closet knob that's missing there. Now, if you remember at the start of the show, this project had a large pile of wood right in the middle of the floor, and the painters were not complete, and the trim man had not completed installing all of the trim. Well, as you can see, all of the work is just about complete, and the taupe color that was selected for the walls, I think, is just very appropriate for this type of room, with the white contrasting trim really blends well with the beautiful heart pine floor. I think you'll agree with me that it's really turned out nice. Another thing that really turned out great is the bathroom that's been completed. We have a real nice cultured marble shower stall with a seat and the clear glass shower door that we're using more and more in bathrooms because it really creates a more of a spacious feeling in a smaller bathroom. Also, the custom cabinets with the wood vanity and the toilet topper cabinet that actually has a towel rod under the toilet topper itself and the ceramic floor really is a good finishing touch. It's a very simple ceramic floor. It looks great in the bathroom. Now, another thing that we did in the design of this project that I think will work well on a long-term basis is building a closet just to the side of the room itself. 
Now it being used as a game room now, this will be good storage for all of the little board games and things that are associated with a game room. But also later on, if a homeowner wanted to use this room for a mother-in-law suite or a guest room, you've got the coat closet right there in place. Now adjacent to that, we built an area for the homeowners to use now for storage of their golf cart. Later on, if someone wanted to use that as storage for a lawnmower, it would be perfect for that as well. Now at this point in the job is when you're starting to work on what we call the punch list or the final list that usually is generated by the contractor to really get the project up to the level of completion that they really like to see. Then it's time for the homeowners to walk through and point out any concerns that they may have. Now at this point in the job and on any type of punch list, usually the painter plays a big part in really polishing up all of the edges of the job. He's in the process now of taking care of a few little dings and dents that he has on some of the walls and some of the trim that's inevitable when you have the hardwood floor men out and the floor as well as electricians with dirty fingerprints, these kind of things. Maybe it doesn't make the painter very happy, but it's a real necessity to finish out a job. Now one of the things that was done yesterday as one of the finishing touches is the last coat of sealer was installed on the hardwood floor. Our hardwood floor installer is on the job taking a look at the finished product. Well Michael, what do you think of the finish? Danny, I'm real happy with it. I'm checking and make sure it was nice and smooth, make sure they didn't leave any spots unfinished. Everything looks great. Yeah, it really does. This is Michael Browning, our hardwood floor installer, who's taking care of this heart pine floor for us. And now how many coats did you end up putting on it? Danny, we applied three coats, one coat of seal and two coats of polyurethane. Okay, now this is, I understand, a satin finish um, instead of the high gloss. I understand the high gloss really is not suggested. That's correct. This is a satin finish. And it turned out real good for this room here because nice big room, a lot of natural light coming in. So the reflection off the floor does, it's not irritating to the eyes where the high gloss would be. Okay. Now in some parts of the country, maybe they're not familiar with the antique hard pine. How is it different than the oak flooring? Well, the, the hard pine has a lot of characteristics to it, a lot of quarter saw, a lot of plain saw. So we have a lot of variety of color in this and the finish brings it out. It's a very popular floor. You know, it's got great character, you know, and, and the thing that's surprising, even though some people may think of this as more of a rustic look, I've seen it in just some real nice homes, real nice additions, and it just seems to go with any kind of room. Danny, this floor goes with anything. Good. Now, this was a different situation in that we had a concrete slab here. So in order to install this three-quarter inch thick wood, we had to install a subfloor of plywood before this was installed. Now, in a project coming up in just a few weeks, we'll take a closer look at that process. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank Stay man. with us. We'll be right back. Now for a bit of news from the great outdoors as Danny takes a look around the yard. If you're having some trouble in your yard in certain areas getting things to grow, you may need a soil test. Now soil tests can tell you about the soil nutrients, the structure of the soil, as well as the pH, and give you some suggestions on how to improve it. Now your local extension service probably offers this service, if not they can recommend a lab that can handle it for you. Now soil test is only as good as the soil sample. Now here's a method of obtaining a good soil sample. Using a round pointed shovel, push the shovel into the soil six to seven inches deep, then push the handle forward to open a wedge shaped hole. Collect your sample by scraping soil from the side of the hole with a spoon. Do this in one stroke from the hole's bottom to the top to capture soil from various layers. Place the sample in a clean plastic bucket. Now make sure you don't use a galvanized bucket or other metal container because they can contaminate the sample with zinc, copper, and other elements. Gather soil from several places and mix it together, then place it in a plastic bag and you're ready for the lab. 